see the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. We are delighted to be back for another Bible study. Amen. For our weekly Bible study, we thank God for his goodness. Let me firstly ask uh, that those who are online as visitors, uh, please, I ask that you be appropriately attired. If you're unable to, please turn off your video. Praise the Lord. We are in church. We are in God's presence and we want to be appropriately attired. Amen. God bless you. Uh, we thank God for his goodness and for his mercies. Amen. We honor him and we worship his marvelous name. Our God is great. Hallelujah. And greatly to be praised. And we're here on tonight. Amen. To worship him and to study his word together. Let us pause as we pray in Jesus' name. Gracious God and our Father, hallelujah. We adore you, Lord. We magnify your name. Lord God, you are great. Yes, you are great and greatly to be praised. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity, oh God, to be gathered together from various locations. Oh God, across the globe, amen, God, as we come together, we give you thanks for this privilege, this opportunity. Oh God, we give you praise for you are the way maker. Oh God, you open doors for your people. So in spite of this, oh God, pandemic, oh God, with, with restrictions, we are able still, oh God, to meet, oh God, on these platforms to Oh God, study your words and to worship your great name. So invite, oh God, your presence with us on tonight. Be with us in respective homes. Let, oh God, your glory, hallelujah. Oh God, be with us. Your presence, oh great God, be with us. Bless every individual on this line tonight. Oh God, touch those who are sick. Yes, Lord. Touch them in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh God, bless and strengthen the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Those who are not saved, Lord, save them. Those who are weak, strengthen them. Oh God, the backsliders, great God, bring them back, oh God, to your fold. Hallelujah. We commit ourselves into your hands, oh God, tonight. We ask your God to lay your hands upon our teacher. Oh God, anoint him, use him, Father, to the glory, honor, and praise of your great name. Oh God, we come against our plan that was tonight to bring all oh the disruption. We rebuke of a plan of the adversary right now. We speak, oh God, that all will be done. Oh God, the lands will be stabilized. Oh, internet will hold up their father in the name of Jesus Christ. Bless everyone to us. We give you thanks. We worship you. We magnify you. Oh, hallelujah. In Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake, hallelujah. And all the people of God say amen. 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 The people of God say amen. 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 Yes. amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Again, God bless you, everyone. And I welcome and greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Again, we're coming to you from Bethel Apostolic Church in Stonehill, St. Andrew. I am your brother in Christ, Devon Brown, along with my wife, Mr. Janet Brown, and our associate pastors and officers and members. We welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study. Amen. We thank God for all of you who are with us tonight, our members, our visitors, amen, other pastors and office from other churches. We want to thank God for you. And we have online tonight in Bethel, Art Hill, Bethel, Aleppo, Bethel Temple Hall. My God, even Bethel Portmore is with us tonight. Members from Bethel South Camp, 
Amen. God bless you. God, Bethel Lionel Town, yes. Hallelujah. Bethel Darlington, God bless you tonight. We want, just want to welcome you. And we have also other pastors and members from other churches. We welcome those from UPC. We welcome those, amen, with us from various, amen, other body of members of the body of Christ. We give God thanks for you tonight. Let me also welcome those in the diaspora. God bless you. We have saints here from Antigua. A big shout out to Antigua tonight. God bless you. We have persons here also from across the U.S. Yes, the U.S. in the house. God bless you. Canada is in the house. God bless you. We have members also from the UK, yes, up there in Birmingham and down there in London. God bless you. We just want to welcome you. Amen. Whether you are on the Zoom, amen, the Zoom room, or whether you are on YouTube or Facebook, we welcome you tonight to our Amen Bible study. And many of you perhaps will join us amen, based on your time zone. We want to welcome those who join us later on from Africa. Yes, we have a good following in Africa. Yes, Zambia, I mean, Kenya. I, mean, I know you perhaps will be asleep now, but we look forward to you as you join us later on. Amen, tonight, amen, our time. God bless you. So bless you, we welcome you, we bless God for you. And we are already feeling God's presence. We know it's in our midst. Yes, to bless us and to do us good. We're about to introduce a, a, a new series tonight. Praise the Lord, we are, we are moving now to study uh, the, the tabernacle. It is a very intriguing study, amen, very powerful study, amen, and we wanna thank God for having led us to focus in this season, amen, on the series on the tabernacle. And we are so happy to have with us a friend, a brother, somebody who lectures, amen, uh, amen, this subject in, 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 at Bible school, a man of God who is committed to the cause of Christ, a young pastor, praise the Lord, uh, a, a husband, amen, a, a, a father, yes, and more so a son of God. We are blessed to have him as a member of the Bethel organization, doing a tremendous work over there in Port Moore across the waters, and I would like you to help me welcome our teacher, receive, amen, Pastor Romano Willis and the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. God bless you, Pastor. Good to see you. Good to have you. Over to you now. So all yours. God bless you. God bless you, Bishop. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. Honor the presence of the Lord tonight. Certainly the Lord is with us. Where two or three are gathered, he did promise that he would be with us. And our hearts are truly grateful. We thank God for one more day on the planet. Those who work alongside Bishop, the executive team in Stony Hill, to all of my father's children, especially those from Bethel, Portmore. My God, I see many of the Portmoreites in the house tonight. My God, thank you, Jesus. Praise God, praise God, praise God. And so we greet everyone in the precious name of the Lord, visiting ones, and especially if you're a first time visitor, God bless you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And so tonight, <clears throat> we want to focus our attention on the tabernacle study that was said earlier before. And we want to look at this study for several reasons. And it's important for us to understand and appreciate the study in and of itself. Uh, we're talking about the dwelling place of Almighty God. While he was here through in the, during the Mosaic period, I've got to understand that God has always desired to dwell with his people. We saw him walking in the garden alongside Adam in the beginning. Saw him communing with Abraham and the patriarchs of old, under the Mosaic period, he instructed him to build a house, to build a tabernacle, so that he would dwell amongst his people. We saw him in the fullness of time, where God tabernacled in flesh. The Bible says the word became flesh and dwell among us. And after he had, after he had died, buried, and resurrected, his spirit, he 
himself returns to abide, to dwell within the church of the living God. And so we see God has always desired to tabernacle, to dwell with his people. And so it's crucial then that we understand and appreciate God's dwelling place. And if there's anybody who should really be interested in the dwelling place of God, it must be the child of God because we have become the dwelling place of God. It is important to note that basically one chapter, Genesis chapter one, basically gives us an overview of, of man's dwelling place, the earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and, and the descriptions are there to tell us what happened on the first, second, third, right down to the seventh day and the animals and the, and the, and the moon and the stars and the sun and, and works. And mankind has been fascinated with his own dwelling place. And out of that dwelling place, Mankind has come up with various different studies uh, as, they, as they are intrigued by the animals and, and, and you have zoologists and, and they're intrigued by, by, by things that are taking place in the earth core. And, and so we have archaeologists that are digging the earth and, and persons are fascinated by the world under the ocean and, and, and they're plummeting the skies and the astrologers and you name it. Mankind comes up with various different studies concerning their own dwelling place. One little chapter. How much more the dwelling place of God that between Old Testament and New Testament, God has dedicated over 50 chapters to the dwelling place of God. Can you imagine if we took on the challenge to begin to dig deep into the things of God? Hallelujah. And so God, without a shadow of a doubt, desires for us to search him out, to investigate, to find out that which concerns his dwelling place. And one of these days, we're going to a city, my God and Savior. Let not your heart be troubled, he says. You believe in me, believe in my father's house. Guess what? Don't worry yourself. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place. We're going to be, we sing about it. We're, we sing about it. We preach about it. We're going over yonder, my God, to be with the king. And so it's important then that we understand this dwelling place. Hallelujah. We have become. Hallelujah. Those of us who have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, repented of our sins, been baptized in the wonderful name of Jesus and received the Holy Ghost. We have now become the dwelling place of God. And so when we begin to explore this particular study, which is the pattern that the Lord has given to us to understand God's redemptive plan. Then we begin to understand and appreciate what it really took the Lord to save our own souls. What it took him to get to a place where sinful humanity could come into a relationship with a holy God. It is at this particular structure that we learn these lessons and begin to appreciate so great salvation. Knowing that the cost was so much, my God and Savior, if we have not been to the tabernacle, we don't really appreciate what the Lord has really done in our own lives. And so it's crucial then that we explore the things of God, especially as it relates to the plan, the tabernacle plan. It is, it is describing for us not only God's dwelling place, but even a prescription as to how we should come before God. You know, sometimes people say, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to come before God. Brethren, there's a prescription in the Bible that tells us how to. When the doctor gives you a prescription, you go and fill it. The Lord has given us a prescription that tells us how to come before him. I know we're singing the song, come just as you are. But God has terms and condition. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He has terms and condition that governs relationship, that governs even how we approach him because he is king and he's a holy God and you cannot run in on the king. We saw examples of that in Old Testament where those who came before the Persian king in the time of Esther um, would actually suffer the fate of death if it is that the king did not stretch out the scepter. And, and, and Esther knew that. She said, if I perish, I perish, but I must see the king. And, and if, the, if the king had not stretched out the scepter, she would have died. 
And so you don't approach the king any anyhow. It has to be based on his terms, his condition. He took the he took these persons and and he had them in his harem, and they had to be processed and prepared to come before the king. And so it is. We also, if we're ever going to come before the king of glory, I know he's our friend and he calls us friend. I know he's our savior and he has, he has died to save our souls. But we all got to understand that he is the king of glory and we can't just run in on him. There's requirements as to how we actually approach him. Praise the name of Jesus. And so tonight, this is just an overview to give us a taste. We want, and, I, and I pray that this taste will inspire us to go deeper and to begin to seek out the things of God, to understand his dwelling place. I tell you, brethren, if we ever understood the dwelling place, we wouldn't, we would be careful as to even how we come to church. You know, the Bible gives us very much, plenty of clues. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. David understood that. Because he's coming from a tabernacle perspective where, where when they entered, when they went to the temple, when they went to the tabernacle, they were excited. They were jubilant because they knew that they were carrying their sacrifices before God. And they knew that they're going to experience forgiveness, grace, mercy, love. My God and Savior. They didn't turn up at the house of the Lord and say, boy, another Sunday again. What is this? We're going to preach today. That was never the attitude of those who entered the house of the Lord. And so tonight we want to look at the pattern, the purpose, and the prefigure of the church. And so the tabernacle served as a place for God to dwell amongst his people. And a place where his people could commune with him. All right? So a place where God would dwell amongst his people he did tell them that they ought to build me build me a tabernacle build me a dwelling place in in exodus chapter 25 and verse number eight he says and let them make me a sanctuary that i may dwell among them build me a house so i can tabernacle stay live amongst my people this structure stood as a visual reminder to israel that they serve the true and living God. Remember now, they're coming out of Egyptian bondage. They're coming out of a place where there are a multiplicity of gods. In Egypt, you have a God for everything. And God pulled down the gods of Egypt. And he brought them into a place of wilderness. Where there's nothing but sun as far as, far as the eyes can see. And sky above you. And God is saying, guess what? I want you to see that I am the only God. I've got to get rid of the Egypt the Egypt mentality that you have. I've got to show you that there is one God that you can put your trust and your confidence in. And I am the same God. My God, the same one who brought you through the Red Sea has the capacity and the ability to heal you. Don't need another God to heal you. And I'm the same God who knows how to fight for you. And all of this happened progressively as God decided to reveal himself to his people in this wilderness trek. My God and Savior. And sometimes the Lord has to pull us aside to, to reveal himself to us so that we can know him for who he is. And if there's any, brethren, if I was reading the book of Revelation, parts of it the other day, and it came on forcibly to me that, you know, our, the, the Christian's desire, ultimate goal and passion must be to know who the Lord is. It, it, it's our foundation. Um, Peter got the revelation. You know, who do men say that I am? And he says, thou art the Christ of something. Upon this rock, upon this revelation of who I am, I'm going to build a church. So, so our knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, is the very foundation of the church. is the foundation of the dwelling place of God. And, and, and it doesn't matter how long we are with the Lord. There's so much depth. We can't exhaust the knowledge and the depth of Almighty God. The length and the breadth and the height is so deep and so wide. But, but, but you can understand then when Paul says, oh, that I might know him after years of being in relationship with God and having visions and dreams and revelation and being used mightily by God. Still, there's a passion and there's a yearning and there's a desire within. Oh, that I might know him. And, and, and as I read Revelation, you know, the first revelation that John got on the Isle of Patmos 
was the revelation as to who Jesus Christ really is. He's the same John who saw him here on earth in the flesh. He's the one who linked upon his breast and was very close to him. He's the only male disciple that found himself at the foot of the cross. And Jesus handed over his mother to him and said, hey, take care of my mommy. My God and Savior. Somebody's got to be really close that you trust dearly for you to hand over your mother to. And, and, so, and, and, and John wrote in his epistle, that which we are, our eyes have seen our, and, and our hands have handled the word of life. And with all of that revelation, he opened their understanding to the scriptures that they can understand the scriptures. And with all of that revelation, here comes the Isle of Patmos experience where God began to unveil himself. Can you imagine the revelation that John got? Hallelujah. The Lord of glory. The King of Kings, my God, the Jehovah of the Old Testament, the Almighty God. He got an insight. He got a revelation. It, 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 yes, I've seen him in the flesh and I've come to know that he is God in the flesh. But, but take me to a height that I've never been to before. When you draw me aside to the Isle of Patmos and unclothe yourself before me, my God, if we could ever get to that lonely place or that alone place with God like Jacob was left alone. Our name and our nature and our life and our walk will be forever changed. And we will know God. for. And, 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 and even after we have come into that initial experience of the Holy Ghost baptism, it is important, brothers and my sisters, that we really have an encounter with God for ourselves. It will cause us to walk before him circumspectly. It will cause us to walk... Peter got a, um, Paul got a revelation for himself and he was never the same. And each and every one of us, if we really seek him, he will reveal himself. And where we are, we'll never be there. We go deeper and higher than ever before. May the Lord help us to go to where I've never been before as we explore the things concerning the Lord. The structure and service showed as sinful people, how they could come before a holy God in worship and in service. All right, so how do I approach him? And how do I offer sacrifice for sin? Because he who is holy will not tolerate sin. And we were born and shaped in iniquity and in sin that our mother conceived us, couldn't just run in on the Lord. So he shows us how to and receive instructions and counsel from God's word. So when we approach him, there's a response that comes from him. Thus, it was a graphic portrayal of God's redemptive plan for his people. So God has always, from before the foundation of the world, that he has a plan to redeem us before we even fell in the first place. And this outline, this study shows us that particular plan. And that's why it's so crucial for us to understand and appreciate our very root, our very foundation, and if we do so, we have a greater understanding. It, it, it's going to be difficult for you to want to backslide if you ever know where we're coming from and, and know what it cost the Lord and, 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 and what, it, what he went through to, to bring us to a place where sinful humanity could come into relationship with a holy God. My God, somebody need to give him praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. It had not been Hallelujah. for the Lord. Hallelujah. On my side. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. My God. We've got a testimony, brethren. If it had not been for the Lord, I'd have been dead and forgotten. Dead and rotten and forgotten and in my grave. But for the mercies of Almighty God. Jesus. And so every aspect of the tabernacle, every, somebody say every. Yes? Every detail. From the brazen altar where the sacrifices were offered for sin. To the mediating priest who offered the sacrificial blood on the mercy seat. Pointed to God's redemptive plan every piece and we're going to show you a picture for those of us who are not familiar with the structure we're going to show you a picture shortly but but every minute detail was not there just for chance god has god is specific in what he's doing and the very minutest of detail is critical for the salvation plan the people could only approach god through a blood atonement and a mediating priesthood can you imagine? Back then, you had to have a priesthood in place and blood had to be shed in order for us to actually approach Almighty God. Otherwise, we couldn't come before him. 
as as simple as it is. We're going to get to New Testament eventually and see how that works out today because this study is applicable to our lives today. Like I said before, not only did it uh, was it a typology of Jesus Christ himself, but it also speaks to us, the church, who have now become the dwelling place of Almighty God. And so this was typified in the ministry of Christ who left his throne in heaven and tabernacled amongst his people. We see that in John 1 and verse 14 that the word was made flesh and dwell among us. And so in Christ, we have the high priest and a perfect blood sacrifice. And through his blood sacrifice, we got access to God for all who put their trust in him. So the Old Testament type was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is the Old Testament sacrifice. He is the Old Testament priesthood that made it possible for you and I to come before a holy God and find grace and find mercy and find access. I can't tell you how beautiful it is to have access. It's, 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 it's awesome, brethren. You mean the one who created heaven and earth who has all power, we have got access to him? Yes, we do. Ask Esther about access. She was able to come before the king because she has access. And as a result, she was able to save an entire nation. When you have got access, things happen. Things get changed. Ask Daniel. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's got access to the throne room of Almighty God. He went before God and said, Lord, the king had a dream. He said he doesn't know what it is. I want you to tell me what it is. Daniel has access. You mean to the omniscient one, the, no, the one who knows all things. He knows the cure of the cancer. The one who knows all things. We have got access to him through his blood. And so as we look back at Old Testament and we start to come to the New Testament, we start to appreciate the work of Jesus Christ and what has happened in our own lives. Somebody give him praise and glory. Somebody say, access, my God. Have you any rivers that you can't tunnel, you can't cross? You have a situation that you don't. Ask Moses when he's at the Red Sea. And the Red Sea is before him. The enemy is behind. Mountains on either side. <laughs> Moses have access. Lord, talk to me. Straight to heaven. Right in the midst of murmuring people. He had access to the throne room of God and God spoke to him, download. That's prayer. That's prayer. <laughs> prayer. <laughs> you get answer when you actually pray. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> when we pray, God answers. Don't stop until you get the answer. Patiently I wait for the answer. Say Psalm 40 and verse 1. Well, the truth be told, many times we don't wait for the answer and we do what we want rather than what he really wants for us. So the enemy is coming. You can't afford to get edgy because you know who calls you. And you see, the Bible says the children of Israel knew the acts of God, but Moses knew the way. The way of the Lord. And that's important to note. So they saw the mighty miracles and he saw how God plundered Egypt. They saw water turn into blood, the river Nile. They saw the, the many miracles that Moses, uh, the plague was on the land and, and their animals were dying. But in Goshen, they were secure. They saw that. They saw the acts of God, but they did not know the way of the Lord. But Moses, so you can be in church and see miracles and still end up in hell and don't trust God and doubt him and die in the wilderness. It's not sufficient to know the acts of God. So yes, God has performed some miracles in your life. Good, but that's not enough. You need to know the way of the Lord. The devil can perform miracles too. We need to know the way. Ask Moses. Moses threw it on his rod. He became a serpent. Pharaoh didn't even respond and say, hey, let one of his scouts deal with this. And one of his scouts threw down their rod. And when they threw down their rod, it became serpent. Can you imagine? <laughs> Pharaoh must have said, what your God can do, my scouts can do. Your God is no match for me. 
so the enemy can perform miracles. But when my rod, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, eat up your rod is a whole different ballgame. Authority is demonstrated. Power, real power is demonstrated because you don't have no more rod. <laughs> Holy Ghost, thank you, Jesus. We've got access. Somebody say access to the throne room of God. And so the Lord provided a pattern. Brethren, this pattern came from heaven. The pattern, it came from heaven. God gave it to Moses and told him how to build. Gave him details like he gave Noah instructions as to how to build the ark. And that's why it's important to, to follow what the Lord says because it is what the Lord says that's going to actually cause us to be saved. And so we've got to follow his instructions clearly. All right, so he gave, him, he gave them the pattern as to how they should build um, this, the structure, the tabernacle for him to dwell in. It's his house. And, and he wants to be in there. It's his house. So, so make it, okay, I have a blueprint for my house. I'm giving you the blueprint. And I'm telling you, don't make it how you want it to be made. No. Don't make it how you want it to be made. Make it according to the pattern that I have showed it to you. And, 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 and gather the material from willing hearts. Those who are not willing to give you, don't, don't receive anything from them. Let them keep it. If you have your tithe and your offering and you don't want to give it, to keep it. God is not interested. But if you're willing to give it to a, give it with a willing heart, Lord said, come. Come. The Lord receive offering from willing hearts. Because unwilling hearts is not, unwilling hearts um, offering is not accepted by God. The off, and we have that um, demonstrated in the New Testament where those who gave out of their abundance and those who gave of their last, and the Lord said, the widow's might, she gave more than they all. True giving. And guess what? A true worshiper will always give. A, a, a worshiper is a giver. Don't forget that. And so the offering were gold, silver, brass, jewels, fine linen, dye from Egypt, goat's hair, ram skin, seal skin from the Red Sea and shitting wood from Sinai. Where did they get all of this material from? Remember now, there was the war of the gods. God is using Moses as his man to come against Pharaoh. And there's a war that took place. And anytime you have a war, you always have spoils. So God used the people to collect the spoils, to take it from Egypt and carry it through the Red Sea over into the wilderness. And when they get over there, he said, come, bring me some offering. So you can imagine you get this nice gold crown from Egypt and this nice bling bling diamond chain. And when you come, the Lord said, bring it to me. Are you willing to give it? Because it doesn't belong to you. No. It belongs to the Lord. Where you get it from? It's God give it to you. Give it up. Lord of mercy, Jesus. Help us in this place. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he said, collect it. Collect it from a willing heart. We want willing sacrifice. Nothing else will do. My God and Savior, Jesus. Nothing else will do. Don't take it from any other heart. It has to be a heart that is willing. That's the heart I want it from. Praise be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to be willing to give everything unto the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All right. Hear me now. Hear me now. Hear me now. So willing heart, willing heart, willing heart. I hope my screen is stable. Praise the name of the Lord. Willing heart. Give it with a willing heart. Don't hold back. The Lord desire a cheerful giver. One who will give willingly from the heart is what he is expecting and nothing less he will receive at our hand. And may the Lord help us to give as the Lord has so blessed us. Don't hold back on the Lord, brethren. Don't hold back on the Lord. I know there's a struggle today in terms of giving. And, and when you look in this particular text as it relates to what they gave, they gave, they gave so much that Moses had to say, all right, stop, 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 stop. Can you imagine Bishop Brown said, all right, stop, brethren, stop. Don't give anymore. My God. 
Hallelujah. Moses says, stop, brethren, stop. Don't give anymore. He was just giving everything. So, so I oftentimes think about it. Say, in, on the Old Testament system, they gave 10%, you know, as their tithe and offering. And we struggle to give 10% today. And, and that, in that time, they, they use regular lamb. They use animals as a sacrifice. And today we have Jesus Christ as our ultimate sacrifice. And we sometimes struggle about 10%. We should give everything, not, not just a part, everything. You know, they had lamb and give 10. How much more should we give when we have the perfect lamb? We shouldn't hold back on God, none at all. We must give everything. Withholding, nothing. Jesus, have mercy upon our souls, dear God. All right. So they gave all that they got because the Lord had given it to them and they were willing to give back to him. And everything that we have, brethren, we came here with nothing. We came here with nothing and we're going to leave here with nothing. And so might as well we give the Lord everything in Jesus' name. All right. So to, to, today God, this, God desires that his people give themselves first to his service and then bring their gifts willingly for his work. Very important. Before God accepts anything that we give, he has to first accept us. He said, so, so, so Cain and Abel brought their sacrifice. And the Bible says he had respect to Cain. He had, he had respect to Abel and his sacrifice. But to Cain, he had not respect, nor his sacrifice. So before God sees what we give, he actually sees us. So if we are not acceptable in his sight, then what we bring is not acceptable. We can't bribe God. He first accepts us. To Cain and his sacrifice, he had no respect. But to Abel and his sacrifice, he had respect. Because Cain, Abel gave from a willing heart. He gave with everything he gave in faith so let us when we give we must first give ourselves new testament says and this is the new testament language that is really coming from our old testament when paul says i beseech you brethren by the mercies of god that we present our bodies as living sacrifice holy and acceptable give my entirety body spirit and soul unto the lord that's first and foremost and then we give him whatever we bring after that, our time, our talent, and our treasure. Now, the tabernacle was the focal point of Israel's community and life, with the tribes dwelling around its four sides. So the end, remember now, two and a half million people is marching from Egypt, going to the promised land. They're now in the wilderness, 12 tribes of Israel, and he breaks them up into groups of four, and, sp and put them around the tabernacle. And so the tabernacle is in the center. When we're saying, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. That's what we're talking about. He's, in the, he's the center. He's in the center of them. He's, he's their everything. And so they look to him as their source, as their strength. And that's where God wants to be. At the focal point, at the center of our lives. And we see that happening in the tabernacle plan. So on the east side, under the standard of the lion, we have, the, we have Judah, Issachar, and Zebulon. On the west side, under the standard of the ox, we have Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Numbers chapter 2 gives you the outline for further details if you want. You can please retake a note. Um, on the northern side, we have this, under the standard of the eagle, we have Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. So these are the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel that is surrounding the tabernacle, all right? And on the southern side, we have, under the standard of the man, we have Reuben, Simeon, and God. So these are the tribes that are surrounding the tabernacle. And the Lord would distribute them. And, and uh, brethren, every detail about the tabernacle is just absolutely amazing. Because even how he scattered them around the tabernacle, if you were actually in an aircraft, an helicopter, looking down on the tabernacle, along with the tribes scattered around it, you would see the picture of the cross. On either side, equally, you have a, a, um, a similar number on the, on, the, on the northern and southern side. And then the east side, have the least, and then on the west side, you have that long stretch. On the west side, you have the, 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 the smaller amount, and then on the east side, you have that long stretch. So you actually have the picture of the cross, in the tabernacle. We're talking about it being an antitype of what Jesus, of, of the redemptive plan that the Lord has as it relates to redeeming us. 
Because when we get in further, we're going to see how the cross of Calvary ties into this structure that brings us to a greater understanding of what was really taking place on the cross of Calvary. This does not include Moses, Aaron, and the priests and the Levites. So Moses' son, the Quathites, the Gershonites, the Mirahites, who numbered approximately 22,300 and were placed around the tabernacle. So outside of the 12 tribes, you have this inner circle, the Levites, because they were separated from the rest of the, the, the tribes and, and put immediately around. They are the one who stands in the gap. The priesthood stands in the gap on behalf of the people. All right, remember Old Testament type, you had to come to the priesthood for intercession to be made. You couldn't come directly to the Lord. All right. So the outer court was 150 feet long and 75 feet wide, enclosed by fine twine linen, 75 feet high. All right. Its gates, which was on the east side of the court, was 30 feet wide. So there's just one gate, 30 feet wide, is a very wide gate. Um, this is where called, this is where Jesus said, "I am the way." And there's only one way into this tabernacle. There's only one way into the holy of holies. It is through Jesus Christ. All right. So one gate enters in, all right? And each pillar was secured in a bronze socket with cords fastened at the top and tied to the ground with a bronze stake. The pillars were more secured by a silver bar that, that connected them near to the top from which the linen curtains were hung. And each pillar were crowned with a silver capital. All right, trying to get you a picture of what that looks like. I'm seeing someone, I'm having a little bit of a challenge with this video clip. All right. Let's get back and see if we can capture this image. All right. Having a little bit of challenge with getting it to actually see a video. I'm actually trying to get it to see a video clip of the structure that makes it even more plainer for you. All right, so get in there, we get in there, we get in there. Let's see if we can use it like this. Stop the share. Let's get our video here and see. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. The dwelling place of Almighty God. The dwelling place of God. The dwelling place of the Lord. All right. All right. All right. So the first, the furniture in its placement. Let's look at the furnishing of this particular structure. All right, so we have the tabernacle and then we have the furnishing itself on the inside of the particular structure. So the furnishing and its placement. From brazen altar, we said, even unto the mercy seat, typifies the various ministries of Christ on our behalf. And the tabernacle, which is a figure from heaven, with its ordinances was only a figure for the time then present. Hebrews 9 tells us that. But it looked towards Christ's sacrificial death, which was to mediate a new covenant by means of his shed blood for the redemption of mankind. So the Bible explicitly tells us that this Old Testament type pointed to a new covenant that we would actually enter into, which is what the church is now involved in. And so we have it clearly in scripture showing us and so, it's, and, and, and so it's underscoring how important for us to actually know and appreciate this structure for what it is. All right. Now, the outer court had two particular furnishing, what we call the 
brazen altar and the brazen laver. Here on your screen, um, a drawing at the bottom of the, of the page, you can see an orange color box. That's the brazen altar. And then that orange circle is the brazen laver. And then you have a two room building. The first room is the holy place. And then the last room, so the bigger room is called the holy place. And the smaller room is called the holy of holies. All right. And then the outer court is on the outside, which is where we have these two furnishing. So that's a pictorial view of the tabernacle, aerial view from above. So the brazen altar upon which the sacrificial lamb, the animal was offered and their shed blood typifies Christ's redemptive work on the cross on our behalf, whereby all who put their faith in his shed blood are justified and receive remission of sins. Hear me clearly. The brazen altar, after you have come through the gate, the first furnishing that you meet upon, when you, have, when you have entered the gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, this is where it happened. All right? And the first furnishing that you meet upon is the brazen altar. And this altar is where we place the sacrifice for sin. The sacrifice for sin. So in our approach to God, the first thing that must be dealt with is sin. We cannot come before God until we deal with this sin issue. All right? And then when we move from that altar, we have the brazen laver. And, and the, very, the very names, the, bra, which speaks to, the brazen speaks to the brass altar and the brass laver. The metal from which it is made is brass, and brass is symbolic of judgment. Hence, you have the killing of the animal taking place in the outer court. Right? So the animal, you'll take your sacrifice, you'll take your lamb, and you carry the lamb to the priest, and the priest will take that lamb and put him down for about seven days. Because we need to make sure that you could, we don't carry any sick offering before the Lord. The Lord is careful about the offering, you know. If it is sick at all, if we put it down for seven days and it gets sick at all, it is rejected and discarded. You can't bring that come to the Lord. If it has broken leg, unacceptable. It needs to be, it needs to be perfect. So they put on the lamb and check him that he's young, frisky, and ready. Put him down for a couple of days, feed him. He's quite fine. Yes. They take that lamb and you'd rest your hand on the head of that lamb. Put the lamb on the altar and rest your hand on the lamb. And confess your sins. And hear me, brothers and sisters. In a Jewish mind, the sins got transferred from them to the lamb. So now that the lamb has the sin, the lamb needs to die. Poor lamb, somebody would say. He has the sin because we confess the sin. It was placed upon him. And so he dies. So he took my place because I should have died because of my sins. But the lamb took the sin. You see where we're going, right? Very good. Jesus Christ became that lamb. It is this altar that was the cross of Calvary. It is upon this brazen altar, the cross, that the perfect lamb, Jesus Christ, was laid for the iniquity of us all. He dealt with the sin issue first and foremost. If we are approaching God, even in prayer, we need to ask the Lord to cleanse us Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those that trust us. So we enter with worship. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. All of the glory belongs to your Lord. And we confess our sins before him. And then when we get to the brazen labor, which is the second furnishing, we deal with ourself. Because self cannot come before God. We've got to get rid of self. We've got to deny ourselves. We've got to cleanse ourselves. And so provide for the priest 
So, so the, the brazen laver provided for the priest only so he could wash before entering the tabernacle. As they wash in the laver, the, the, the mirrors reflected their images, reminding them of how God saw them. And so the labor speaks of Christ as our sanctification. So just imagine, these, these are brass um, um, furnishing. And, and these brasses shine. You can actually see your face in it. And, and it is filled with water. It's a basin. So they made this large basin and fill it with water. Because when you operate at the brazen altar, the first, um, the first, the first furnishing, and you kill that animal, the blood Splash upon you the dirt from the tabernacle floor. The, the, we get messy and dirty. It's a, it's, a, it's a yucky place. It's a dirty place. It's a sacrificial place. But when you get to the brazen labor, it's time for us to be washed. And so when you look in the water, the mirror is right there. And we can see ourselves. What condition we are in. And we have the responsibility now to just take the water and wash. Wash our hands. Wash our feet. Because he who shall ascend into thy holy hill, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart, before I enter into the presence of God, I've got to wash. So wash me now within, without, and purge me with fire. If I'm going to ever come before God, I've got to be washed. And so the Bible says to wash it is to look into the perfect law of liberty, the word of Almighty God. And when we see ourselves, the word is able to wash us. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed to the word of Almighty God. And so wash me, Lord, so I can come before your presence. We're dealing with sin and self. You know, running on the king. We come as he prescribes. Could it be? That's the reason we have not been able to get answers to our prayer. Because we're trying to run in and we're beating the air rather than actually approaching him as he has prescribed. Deal with sin. Deal with self. Before you enter in. Before you come to the Holy of Holies. We're on our way to the Holy of Holies. But before we get there, we've got to deal with the sin issue. And we've got to wash and get rid of self. We've got to cleanse the self, deny ourselves, mortify the deeds of the flesh, is what we're talking about. Put it under subjection by the power of the Holy Ghost, because no flesh shall glory in the presence of the Lord. In the outer court, you have a lot of noise. A lot of the praise that we do takes place in the outer court, because when you get to the Holy of Holies, you are not heard. Only God is heard. That's where true worship really takes place. In the Holy of Holies. We start in the outer court. Lot of noise. Lot of excitement. Lot of praises. You know, we open our mouth and we shout hallelujah. That's outer court experience. When you talk about worship, it takes place in the Holy of Holies. Where you are not heard anymore. But God is heard. It's like Hannah come before God and she, her mouth is moving, but you heard not a word. But God heard her cry. She entered in before him and he heard her cry and responded to her nine months after she got pregnant. After years of could not, uh, uh, of years of being barren and she could not get pregnant. But she went before the throne room. She had access to the one who was able to open up the womb because he is the one that closed it. My God and Savior, Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't know what your situation is, but guess what? He has made it possible for us to come before him and to make our petitions known and to receive answers from him concerning no matter how hard the situation might be, no matter how difficult it might be. Ask David, when the famine got sore, three years of famine, David got the ephod. Say, hey, bring me the ephod. And he went before the Lord and said, Lord, what is the reason for this famine? And he got an answer. He said it's because of the bloody house of Saul. Now, I don't care how bright you are and how intellectual you are. You couldn't figure that out by yourself. That need revelation. And that revelation comes when you enter in before the Lord. Lord, what is the reason for this famine? Lord, what is the reason for this pandemic? Lord, what is the reason? He has the answer. He is the omniscient one. What is the reason for this famine? He said it's because of the bloody house of Saul. 
King of the dream? What is the dream? Don't worry, King. I'm going before the King of Kings. I'm going to get the answer. And I go and get the answer and I come back and say, Oh, King, live forever. Listen to me, man. We've got the answer for you. This is what you dreamt. Can you imagine the king ever, if Daniel had come back and said, King, don't worry yourself, man. I pray about it and the Lord is dealing with it. You don't worry yourself, all right? That's it. You would lose your head. But he came back and said, Thus saith the God of heaven. This is what you dreamt, and this is the interpretation thereof. Brothers and sisters, we have access. And we have to go to the brazen altar, then the brazen labor. We're talking approaching God, and there's a prescribed pattern in the word of God that tells us how. And this is it. We're moving from the outer court and next we go to the holy place. So the tabernacle proper was 15 feet wide. So we're talking about the structure itself, not the fence on the outside, but the building, the two compartment building is what we're talking about now. And, 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 I'm, and I'm giving some of the details because the Lord is very, 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 it's very interesting. For example, the dimensions of the perimeter fence for the outer court, the length by the width, by the height, gives you the exact dispensation between Moses and Jesus Christ during the law period. How long the law period last? As against when grace started, from the time of Mosaic covenant to the time of Christ, the exact amount of years, multiply the length of the outer court of the tabernacle by the width, by the height, and you get the exact period of time. And a similar thing happened when you get on the inside now. When you multiply the length by the height of the tabernacles proper on the inside, the first room, the holy place, gives us 2,000 square foot, which speaks to the church age that we're living in right now. That also tells us how we should operate as a church right now. This, this study becomes also important because guess what? If we are the royal priesthood, we need to look back at the Old Testament priesthood to understand what is the role of the priest. Because guess what? Now that we, when we get baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, we have entered into the priesthood. You are a priest. What is your role? What is your function in this time in which we live? Get back to the Old Testament. Look at what they did. Take it from the natural, literal, and take it to the spiritual, and we'll understand what we need to do right now. That's part of the importance of the study. The tabernacle proper was 15 feet wide, 45 feet long, 15 feet high. It divided into two sections. The holy place and the Holy of Holies. 48 boards comprise the walls, 20 boards each on the north and the southern side, and six feet, six on the, on the west and two corner boards. Each board was 15 feet long, 27 um, inches wide, covered with gold, and set on two golden tenons, which were secured in silver bases. I, I wish my video was coming up so you can actually show you this um, in graphic form. Um, but nevertheless, the boards were held together by five golden rods, four on the outside and one on the inside. Uh, don't worry. I'm hoping that as we get along, I'll be able to bring it up for you. All right. So the whole, the whole structure had four covering. So it had roof. Right, so inner linen, the first layer, the first section of the roof is embroidered linen, fine linen, and then you had goats hair, and then you have ram skin, and then you have waterproof purple skin. All right, so it's covered rainfall. If it, well, it's a desert, you hardly have any rain, but it was secured and um, well covered and, and, and protected. And with all that animal skin you'd probably want to think to yourself that, you know, it could very well attract flies. And if it does afflict, attract flies, it could very well attract maggots. You know, that's the natural way of thinking. But, but you know what is interesting about God? He's very meticulous in what he does. Because on the inside of the tabernacle, when the priest is offering up incense, which represents our prayer life, the, 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 the specific ingredients that he gave to him as to what he should use to, to make that, that concoction, to burn incense before the Lord, when it rose up into the tabernacle and perfumed the goats here, the ram skin, the linen, and the badger skin, no insect. It had insect repellent in it. No insect could lodge in there. 
So, so what that tells us is that, you see, our, and, and that, that incense rose up from the golden altar on the inside, which really represents our prayer life. So if we have a prayer life that is burning incense on the inside and it begins to permeate and perfume our lives, no evil can tabernacle or dwell or lodge. The devil can lodge his tentacles in, our, in us and, and try to insert his nasty, dirty thoughts in our minds. Because guess what? The prayer life would perfume our mind and would actually be covered securely. There's covering on this structure. That speaks to the covering that he gives. And our covering is not a natural, it's spiritual covering. And so our minds are covered. My God and Savior Jesus, holy God, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. My God, you need to come to Bible school that we can get into the details. This is just an overview. It, it, it's so intriguing and fascinating. It's amazing what God has done for us. The holy place was entered through a hanging called the door, while the holy of all is was entered through what you call a veil. All right, so the gate was the way and the door was the truth and the veil was life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. So this is where it's at in the Old Testament tabernacle at this particular structure. When you enter the gate, that's the way to enter in. And when you went through the first, the first um, 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 curtain, that's the door that leads you into truth because behind that veil, I, no, not veil, behind the door. Because the veil, which is the separates the holy from the holies, you have the Ark of the Covenant. That's life taking place inside there. All right? Because God's awesome, holy presence, tabernacle. On top of the roof, you had a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. There was a visible manifestation of the presence of God with them. They knew that God was with them. They, the cloud shielded them from the hot scorching sun that pelted the desert in the day. And the pillar of fire by night protected them from the cold, from being freezing because in the desert, the temperature shifts drastically between night and day it becomes it becomes so cold in the night you need warmth and guess what he is their covering he is their their their, their shield the sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night he was their guard their, 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 their guide and their covering and everything that they need they found it in him and he had to do this because guess what they're coming out of egyptian bonds where they depend on other things to help them like like many of us when we came out of the world we're depending on that person over there to provide for this situation and one man one woman of one man over there so one man over there so one more we had different resources but when you come to jesus he's my everything mighty god and savior jesus somebody has a testimony giving praise and glory Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I found him to be a friend. I found him to be my everything. There's no lack in him. He's the God of abundance. Hallelujah. Where everything else fails, he never fails. May not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. And he knows exactly how to supply my needs according to his riches in glory. My God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The Lord is in this place. Hallelujah. Somebody praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 I don't just want us to just listen. I want us to become participate, um, participants of, of what the Lord is doing even in this session. Because guess what? You can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You can become the dwelling place of God this very night. As we share the word of God, as to how God got inside of the tabernacle. Brethren, it had to be prepared as to how he prescribed it. Let me run ahead a little bit and get back. Just to help somebody online to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So God said, build me the tabernacle. And they build the tabernacle. But God is not in there as yet. There's no pillar of cloud by day and there's no fire by night. All right? So it's an empty structure. It's an empty shell. But they had to offer a sacrifice, and the, author, and the sacrifice had to be acceptable. And they put that sacrifice on the brazen altar, on the outside. And when they did, they waited for the fire. God had to light it. And the fire came from the Holy of Holies and light that sacrifice, which was God's sign of approval that the sacrifice that was offered was acceptable. 
whenever you place an acceptable sacrifice on the altar, God will answer by fire. The one, the sacrifice that is acceptable is the one that is required. The one that he asks for. Present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. I've got to present. If, if, if I can't give God all, he's not interested. He doesn't want a part of me. He wants all of me. To give him a part is called prostitution. And a prostitute on the side of the road gives her body. She's just waiting to collect. She's not really involved in the process. When you come to church and clap and sing and dance and shout and her heart is not in it, it's called prostitution. Giving our bodies, our heart is not in it. I, I'm, I'm in the house, but my mind is on the other side of town. At home, thinking about the exam. At home, thinking about tomorrow on the job. At home, thinking about Sunday evening rice and peas. You're joking, man. Come on. We're talking about giving God everything. I ask myself the question, could it be why the Lord has put us out of the sanctuary to get us to that place where we'll actually come into his presence on our own, from our own space and come into deep, intimate relationship with him? So the next time we go to the house of God, like we used to do in the old days, we carry the fire from house and carry it to the sanctuary. My God and Savior. But most of what we do today is, is go to the house to try and start the fire. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. And so he, he would put the sacrifice on the brazen altar. God would answer by a fire and send the fire from the Holy of Holies and it consumed. And they, would now take, they had no responsibility to keep that fire aglow. Put wood under the sacrifice. Use the coal from the fire. And carry it and put it on the altar of incense in the holy place. Use the fire from the brazen altar and put it on the lampstand. Because if you take any other fire from elsewhere, it's called strange fire. And Aaron had two sons, Nadab and Abihu, who took strange fire and God killed them dead. Uh, if my revelation doesn't come from the cross of Calvary, if it doesn't come from the brazen altar, where I lay my sacrifice. If I don't enter through the Lord and deal with my sin issue, there's no revelation to get because there's no fire. And if there's no fire, there's no revelation because guess what? The light, the, the, the light that illuminates the holy place comes from the fire of the brazen altar. So I take the fire from the brazen altar, put it on the lampstand in the holy place and illumination takes place, revelation takes place. If I don't go to the cross, so I, I'm, I'm approaching God through prayer and I offer my sacrifice for sin and he forgives me and he allows me to draw closer to him and I get revelation and I come before the people of God and reveal what he has revealed unto me. If I don't get it from there, it's strange fire. It didn't come from the altar the brazen altar, the altar of sacrifice where I laid my sacrifice for sin. Oh, God, help us, Jesus. Help us, Lord. Help us. There are three pieces of furnishing. Am I out of time, Bishop? Tell me when to stop. There are three pieces of furniture, furnish, furniture in the holy place, which typifies our fellowship with Christ. So outside we deal with sin. And self, and then when we get to the holy place, we're talking about having fellowship with the Lord. We don't reach to the most holy place as yet. We're just in the holy place now. And so we have to deal with sin and self first. We're talking about approaching God. Even praying, you know, this structure is about prayer as well, brethren. If I'm going to talk to the Lord and get before his throne, I've got to deal with my sin, deal with myself. And when I get to the holy place, I need to eat some bread. It's called the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. I need light. I need fire, which comes from the brazen altar to bring revelation. So when I open up the word, I get revelation because I can now see. Which is why we have the fire of the Holy Ghost in our souls. So when we read the word from that fire, we get revelation because the light, there's no JPS in the holy place. There's only fire that comes from the brazen altar. And when you light it, remember, in there is just beautiful because the walls are gold. Beautiful gold. And so it's shining inside there. Beautiful, pretty. Revelation comes. And the Lord says, make sure that you don't let the lamp go out. 
Just like how if you don't wash, you're dead. And if you carry a strange fire, you're dead. And you can't let lamb go out. You're dead. <laughs> you know, when in the Old Testament, we drop down dead and I guess we would know that we're dead, but we are just dead. The sad, the sad part is that when we die in the New Testament, we don't even know that we're dead because we get spiritually disconnected and don't even realize we're left with tongues and left with human efforts and don't even realize that we're disconnected. Jude described it as, as, as twice plucked up, um, you know, they're, 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 they're withered and they're manifesting, they're still in church, but using, using, using human efforts to do the work of the Lord rather than relying on the power of Almighty God. On the right side stood a table of shoe bread with 12 loaves representing the 12 tribe in the holy place. This furnishing typifies Christ who came down from heaven and all who partake of him have eternal life because he is our sustainer. So you can't get into the holy place unless you stop at the table of bread because you're going to need supernatural strength to get before Almighty God. All right? So, so part of our prayer life is not just confessing our sins and dealing with ourselves. It, all, it also includes reading God's word. Our prayer, brethren, our devotional life. When we stop, and that's why we must take time in prayer. We can't rush. And so part of the praying is also reading. So we stop and we begin to read the word of the Lord as the Lord lead us. You turn, you, you put on the fire on the lamp. You can see the bread and you eat of the bread because where am I going? I'm going into the Holy of Holies. I'm going before the throne room of Almighty God. On the left side of the tabernacle stood the seven branch lampstand, golden lampstand, pure gold. This is typical of Christ, the light of the world and all who trust in him are given the light of life. And that's how we become the light, right? We have light to know, shed because Jesus Christ gives us light. He gives us the fire. And he says, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. We became light because he is the ultimate light. And he came and lived and, tabern and tabernacled in my life. And so he expects us to shine before this world and to obliterate the darkness. And we see a darkness that is taking place in our world, in our nation, in our own island, Jamaica. My God and Savior. There's a darkness that is creeping in and it's creeping into the church. We've got to push back the darkness. And only light can push back darkness. And brethren, no matter how dark it gets, guess what? One spark of light causes illumination to take place and cause darkness to flee because darkness and light can't be in the same space. The moment the light comes on, darkness goes. Let your light so shine before men. And this nation needs light. And we get light from the brazen altar when we lay our sacrifice for sin he sends a fire that burns within our soul and we have the responsibility to maintain the fire of the holy ghost in our lives and we cannot afford that fire to go out holy god help us jesus hallelujah mando rabashiandai hallelujah you cannot afford we cannot afford the fire to go out the darkness is getting darker. And the truth be told, there are many persons who have died, who, 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 who are living in their own homes and there's darkness inside there. There's persons who are demon possessed. There's a darkness. Where is my light that caused darkness to flee and dark works to go? Makorabashandai. Holy Ghost. Mashi Makorabasai. Light of my life is Jesus. Holy Ghost. Makendoshai. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The light of my life. We need to get back to the altar. Lay the sacrifice. I beseech you, I beg you, Paul says, by the mercies of God. Look at what he did. Look at Calvary. And you see the mercy being displayed. By the mercies of God, I beseech you that you present be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and present your body, body, spirit, and soul as a living sacrifice. This house is not my own anymore. It's the tabernacle. It's the temple of the living God. I can't take this house and do what I want with it because it has been bought with a price. Blood was shed for this. You can't bore up this as you like. 
and put all kind of coloring and paint on it. No, it belongs to Jesus Christ. We're talking about holiness. That's what the tabernacle typifies. Because how does a sinful person approach a holy God? You got to come by holiness because without holiness, no man shall see God. And this is what it talks about. The closer we get, we begin to strip away the things of this world go strangely dim. Hmm, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You can't enter in how you want. You can't wear what you want. It's got to be prescribed by him. You're coming before me. Oh, God, ask Esther. Ask Esther. She had to wear the king's perfume. It took a whole year for her to be prepared to come before the king. Can you imagine? Spices were prepared. They would get a lattice and several herbs and spread it on the lattice and then we get candles of uh, um candles um with fire on on it and they would put it under the lattice and they would burn the herbs and then these women that that that, that the, the the king would would have in his harem he would actually allow them to go they would strip themselves and lay down on that lattice and and the pores of their body would open up and begin to absorb the herbs and, and, their, and their body would become perfumed and, and as they are presented um one, one writer says in the middle east when you when when you when one of these persons pass you by you could smell the aroma they walked into the elevator and when they walked out then you walked into that elevator the whole elevator was perfumed with the presence because they are saturated when you held on to her hand guess what the very fragrance of her skin came off on your hand the king's perfume the king's anointing is upon us we must carry the fragrance of the Holy Ghost. Mashima, makendo saya, mishi andarabo saya. They would stretch out and lay on that lattice and absorb in their skin and be purified with those herbs, and they would be perfumed. So when the king smell you, you smell like the king because you're wearing the king's perfume. No wonder the Lord anointed the priest. Gave him special concoction as to what he must be anointed on. And it was poured upon Aaron's head and ran down his beard onto his skirt. When he walked past, you could smell him for miles. When he left an environment, you smell the odor of the priest. Because he carried a life that was perfumed. And then we ask ourselves the question, has anybody smelled us recently? What do we smell like? Is the aroma of our lives coming up before the nostrils of God. And God is saying, hmm, you smell sweet. That's my prayer life. Oh, God help us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh God, there's an invitation to come. Meet me in the Holy of Holies. But there's a way to get there. Hallelujah. Abba Father, hallelujah. Help us, Lord. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Lord. Help us. Help us. Help us. We need your help. We need your help, Jesus. We need your help. The golden altar of incense, still in the holy place. So three furnishing, two furnishing the outer court, the brazen altar and the brazen laver. In the holy place, three furnishing. The golden lampstand, the table of shoe bread, and the altar of incense. So the golden altar of incense stood before the veiled, before the veiled holy of holies. So right between the holy of holies, the veil is separating the golden altar of incense from the Ark of the Covenant. Before I get into the holy of holies, I've got to stop at the golden altar of incense. That's where intercession takes place. That's where prayers are lifted up before Almighty God. Starting the outer court just confessing and approaching but intercession takes place in the holy place on the golden altar of incense 
kind of leaves us with a lot of questions in our minds as to where we are. What have we been doing? How am I praying? Am I really praying? This altar typifies Christ as our high priest who intercedes for us. And the believer who offers the sacrifice of praise. Burning coals from the brazen altar were placed on the altar of incense. Over which sweet incense was poured daily. The smoke from the incense presence represents the prayers of God's people coming up before him. And we know that our prayers are bottled up in heaven. Prayers of intercession. Oh God, help us, Jesus. The heavy veil separated a holy God from a sinful people. Christ represents the veil, and that is death at the cross, on the cross. The veil was rent from top to bottom. And this opened up the way to God through his shed blood so that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. This is where the Ark of the Covenant is. Beyond the veil is where the Ark of the Covenant. That's the Holy of Holies. That's where we're going. That's where we're going to meet with Almighty God. So inside the Holy of Holies sat the Ark of the Covenant. Atop the Ark, the rectangular box overlaid with gold was two cherubims facing each other, looking down towards the mercy seat with the wings stretched over it. It was on the mercy seat that the high priest sprinkled the blood on the day of the atonement, which God enabled to cover the sins of the priest and his people. Brethren, this Ark of the Covenant, we say we enter the, th we enter the, can find mercy at the throne of grace without the blood being on the mercy seat. This is the throne of wrath because inside of that Ark of the Covenant, you had the laws of God, the Ten Commandments. You had Aaron's rod that budded, Aaron's rod, a piece of almond stick sitting in the presence of God, came alive in the presence of God because there can be no death, there can be no death. In the presence of Almighty God. Some of you have been taught about the tabernacle in times past that you'd actually put a rope around the priest's foot and you pull him out if he dies. It's impossible. He couldn't die in there. There's no rope that was necessary. There's no rope necessary at all because he cannot die in the presence of Almighty God. Death. There's no death in Jesus Christ. There's absolutely no death in Christ. He cannot die in there. He's in the Holy of Holies and there is a rod that is supposed to be dead because it was taken off the tree from outside and placed in the presence of God. But guess what? It is in the presence and it is alive. It has pushed out a branch and bear a fruit. And a man is on it and alive. And it's not planted in the ground. It's planted in the presence of Almighty God. There is a golden pot of manna where regularly when you're on the outside... If you allow the man to go over into the other day, it stinks. And Maga took it over. And you have a golden pot of manna in the presence of God, fresh. Can't spoil. Because once you get into the presence of Almighty God, we're talking about access to the throne room of grace. Guess what? When the blood was poured on the mercy seat atop of the Ark of the Covenant, it transformed the Ark of the Covenant from a throne of wrath to a throne of grace. So when we say, I'm coming boldly to the throne of grace, you've got to understand where you're coming. Because had it not been for the blood poured on top of that mercy seat, we'd be dead corpse. But when the Lord that required death for sin looks up and says blood poured on the mercy seat, it atoned for us. And we found grace and find mercy. And we can come boldly because of the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lamb of God. Jesus. How much he has done for us. If we could ever stop and appreciate, we wouldn't live any anyhow. The priest had to prepare himself to go before Almighty God. And he was meticulous about what he was doing. And he understood and he couldn't afford to make any mistakes. Because I'm going before the King of Kings and the Lord, the God Almighty, who is tabernacling with us. Oh, God, help us, Jesus. Mark!
When we enter into prayer, we're coming before the Holy of Holies, the great God and King, the one who sits high and looks low. When we enter into his sanctuary, we're coming before the King of glory. Could it be we have not understood who we're coming before? We're coming to meet our friends? No, we're coming before the King of glory. We're coming before the one who the creator of heaven and of earth, the high priest, our God and Savior. Almighty God, help us, help us, help us. We need your help, Lord. We ask you to help us. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Lord. We need help. Hallelujah. The priest's appearance before the tabernacle would represent, represent to the people. The priest's appearance from the tabernacle would represent to the people God's appearance of the blood atonement and the covering of their sins for another year. So the priest went in, poured the blood on the mercy seat, came back out. And when he came into all the court, excitement, worship, praise and adoration, no one noise. But when the priest was on the inside, stillness as they waited to hear because God was dealing with them on the inside. He was working out the sin issue. Blood had to be poured on the mercy seat. And he's got to be very careful as he enter in before Almighty God. Hallelujah. So when he came out, the jubilation, the excitement, because guess what? They knew that the sacrifice was accepted. Our sins are forgiven. We have covering. We have protection. We are now safe. We are in good standing. We have favor. We have the blessings of God. Christ, as the believer's high priest, offered his own blood to put away sins. He is the believer's propitiation. Jesus Christ has become our propitiation, satisfying the righteous demand of a holy God from the judgment of sin, for the judgment of sin, and opening the way from him to freely forgive people of their sins. And this pattern finds its fulfillment in Jesus, the Messiah, who has justified us by his blood. Shimandai cleansed and fed us through his word, light the path before us, and has made intercessions for us. Because of him, we have access through the veil to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy on the merit of his blood. Mikandi Oshama. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Do we understand what Jesus Christ has done for us? Oh God. The tabernacle prefigured the church. So not only did he tabernacle himself, God himself in, in Jesus Christ, the flesh, but now he tabernacles within us. It's a prefigure of the church. Today, God dwells in a spiritual body. Each believer coming together to form a temple. Each of us are lively stones. People, Peter describes us and building up a spiritual house to offer sacrifice before the Lord. It's called the church, the church of the living God. The foundation is the doctrines of the apostles and the prophet, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The church is built upon the foundation of the apostles. What you can't build on any other foundation. What the apostles taught Brethren, the only authentic revelation that we have in written form of Jesus Christ in the flesh is what the apostles wrote in the New Testament. The only authentic revelation in written form of Jesus Christ is in the New Testament, brethren. The doctrines of the apostles and the prophet is the foundation of the church. What the apostles taught, that's what we are building on. You can't build on any other foundation. And that's why we follow what the apostles did because they are, Jesus said in Ephesians chapter 2, they are the foundation. He is the chief cornerstone. The tabernacle is holy and was set apart for God's service as the church is. Today, the church, 
My God, and God wants his church to be at the place where it should be. Today we have this awesome privilege, which was only reserved for high priests once per year. This privilege should cause us to walk circumspectly before Almighty God. Today we can enter in boldly and find grace, find mercy, find peace, because we have got access. Oh God. God, my Savior, Jesus. But is this, is this how we treat the house of God? And when we talk about the house, we're not just talking about the sanctuary where we go. We're talking about the very temple that we have become. Because we are the church of the living God. We're closing. The tabernacle also prefigured the individual Christian. So we talk about Jesus Christ being the embodiment of God, manifested in the flesh. We're talking about the church. And we're talking about our own lives as individuals because we are the church. So he is now tabernacling in us. As a sanctuary, we are not at liberty to allow our bodies to be used outside of his designed purpose. The tabernacle with its many symbols and types was a shadow pointing to our Savior, who is who in his fullness of time tabernacle in this world and opened the way for mankind's redemption. Hebrews 9 says, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, better than Old Testament, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, my God and Savior Jesus. We have been redeemed, bought with a price. Jesus Christ has gave his own life. Let us be the church and be what God has called us to be so that he can, and we have the responsibility to keep the presence of God in. Just like the priests of the Old Testament, they had the responsibility to entertain God in their midst. Because once he's there, there's protection, there's provision, there's blessings. And once he goes, that's it. And he can go. Believe me, he can go. But they had the awesome responsibility. And so, too, so do we today as royal priesthood to maintain, to entertain the presence of God in our own lives because we are the church of the living God. We have now become the dwelling place of Almighty God. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Over to you, Bishop. Hallelujah. 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 Beloved, Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us worship. Jesus. Let us worship. Wow, what a powerful oh. study on tonight. Access granted by a new and living way. Let us therefore draw nigh. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Just type in the chat, access granted by a new and living way. Type access granted by a new and living way. Praise God Almighty. Hallelujah. God bless you, Pastor Willis. God bless everyone of you tonight, praise God, YouTube, Facebook, Zoom platform, my God, praise the Lord. Amen, we learned so much on tonight. We thank God for the way in which he used his servant uh, to, 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 to make easy, amen, praise God, the, the, the tabernacle and its, and its relevance to us, amen, on tonight, we've got to, move from the outer court to the inner court and then move from the inner court into the holy of us of holy of, of holies we've got to know how we enter 
Praise the Lord. God bless you. We want to, as is usual, we spend time in this segment to receive your takeaway or takeaways or answer your questions or even let me clarify if there if there if there's any gray areas we want to clarify those areas. So Pastor Elizabeth is still with us and we want to thank God. Were you blessed tonight? Were you blessed? Were you blessed? Were you blessed? Amen. I, I, I want to acknowledge I see a raise and tonight RX55 you are high. BT, I acknowledge you. Go ahead with your question or your takeaway. RX55 you are high BT. All right, I guess you're worshiping. Praise the Lord. Raising your hands in worship. All right, praise the Lord. We want to take some receive your questions now if you would like to ask a question or share your takeaway. Uh, we have uh, persons from across Jamaica, the Caribbean, the UK, uh, the US, Canada. My God, God bless you. Uh, please go ahead. We want to take your question or, or your takeaway or takeaways. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy Ghost. Let me stop in New York first. New York, New York. You know what in New York like to say something. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yes, um, New York, New Jersey. Any question from that, from those states, the tri-state? If not, let me ask Elder Lincoln Bryan from Canada, Canada to come in and just share his takeaway. Elder Lincoln Amen. Bryan. God bless you, Bishop. God Amen. bless you, sir. Bless you, uh, Pastor Romano. Amen. Praise the Lord. I am tremendously blessed tonight. What a study um, we have had on tonight. I mean, I can. I feel like I am in Bible study slash service. Bishop, I'm not sure if it's the overflow from the fasting service today at Bethel. <laughs> but I am telling you, Lord. an anointing in the room. He, he taught tonight under the anointing of the Lord and under the, the auspices of the Holy Ghost. And I'm so grateful tonight that I could be able to join in this study. Uh, Pastor Romano, you may not remember me. You taught me this 14 years ago, um, the Tabernacle of Moses at Bible College. And uh, the minute I saw it, I was tremendously excited. I was just excited to hear you again um, break this down and I mean, you taught it 14 years ago, and it's it, it's this refresher course is, is some deeper stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I still I still have your notes to this day. Move to two different countries, never leave those notes. I still got it with your name on it. So I am just tremendously grateful and blessed by your teaching on tonight, and I trust that you will uh, continue to teach it. I've learned so much over the um, since you have taught me, and and, and I've even had the pr privilege to teach it to our church in Antigua. From the very notes that you have, have taught me over the over these years, and uh, so tonight we're we're just richly blessed. I was so excited, Amen, to join Bishop and and, and even when Pastor Romano taught you, just to give you a little uh, thing, I I was so excited when I when I learned Tabernacle of Moses, and so when I, I was when I got married, I was telling my wife about Pastor Romano, and I was saying how oh, he's a good teacher, and she listened to everything that I have to say, and when I'm through, she said, Oh, I just wanted to know it's my cousin. <laughs> so just in case I said anything bad, that's when I found out. But God bless you. God bless you, man of God. Continue to do the work. And I'm looking forward to the series. Heaven bless you. Yes, praise the Lord. The, the, the Mackenzie route runs all the way back to Mount Charles. Praise the Lord. God bless you, uh, Doc Brian over there in Canada. We thank God for you. Praise the Lord. Any other takeaway or questions? Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Praise the Lord. Pastor Willis, it was so powerful. It was so clear. Amen. Praise God. Elder Donovan Brown, let me hear your voice, sir, over there in Canada. Elder Brown. God bless you, Bishop. Bless you, sir. Bless you, everyone. Um, powerful teaching tonight, um, Pastor Romano. Um, really love this topic, you know. Yes. Uh, tabernacle. Indeed. One of my favorite topic, topic, because I guess if you don't understand Old Testament, then you can't really get to appreciate the New Testament, and this is really powerful stuff. Uh, and certainly, we'll be tuning in next week for further, for further, more information. I'm excited about this. My uh, God, <laughs> I'm excited about Holy this. Holy Ghost! <laughs> oh, do not encourage the bishop. <laughs> Do not encourage right. me. <laughs> Thank you, Elder, Elder Donovan, Canada. Let me go jump up to upstate New York and invite Sister Donna Montgomery to, to come in and just with her remarks. And she's always uh, a, a part of our study. Amen. God bless Sister Donna Montgomery. Bishop, bless you. Bless you, everyone. It's bless always you. a pleasure. I can't. I the past um, listened to the particulars about the tabernacle and and this lesson reminded me of so much of what I've learned from before and it's always good to always keep a brisk of what we're dealing with and the might and the power you know it's it's so fascinated how God doesn't do anything haphazardly or or without specific um, gramification but you know, Pastor um, Lewis, Willis, I'm sorry, Pastor Willis went into details and just com um, compare the tabernacle to how God operates. And it just make us, to under make us to understand that God doesn't do anything haphazardly, nor without a purpose. So I just continue praying and ask God to keep me in his purpose and his, and his perfect will. I thank God for the word tonight, Bishop. Um, Pastor Willis, well done. I have three pages of notes. As always, I'm taking notes. <laughs> and I, and I, I'm always learning and always reminded. And so for for what I, my takeaway is when when we pray, you know, you, it's not relevant to the tabernacle itself, but when you say when we pray, God answers. And, you know, when we start to compare, compare what what God have done before and what He's still doing now, we can definitely stay faithful. We can still stay somewhat assured that God is still working on the behalf of man. No matter how much we have faltered and failed, God tries so feverishly to hold on to us by showing himself in this mighty way that he's still with us and that he's still showing himself, you know, in, 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 in different ways that we can stay faithful and stay assured that God is with us. Amen. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Bishop. As always, I'm blessed. And thank you, Pastor Willis, for um for this presentation. God bless you, my sister. God bless you, Donna. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, sir. Let me just move go across to, to Aleppo. We have Sister Jessica Stewart Jones from Aleppo and others. So Jessica Aleppo, let us hear tonight your voice with what you'd have taken. What what would be your takeaway from the study tonight? So Jessica Jones. Thank you, Bishop. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. I just Aleppo, finished typing. Aleppo the house. Aleppo. I just finished typing, man, and I was about to press send when you <laughs> called my name. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to just go ahead and read it. <laughs> Pastor Willis, my takeaway tonight is deal with sin and self before you approach the holy place. Also, that there's a prescribed pattern in approaching God. The word tonight was taught with passion, understanding, and power. It was more than a blessing. God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, Aleppo, Mr. Jessica 
Stuart Jones, God bless you. Good to have a leper. So many folks from Aleppo is with us tonight. God bless you. All right, Sister Sister Roach, we want our, our well, Roach, whether it's a sister or brother. Uh, you have raised your hands. Let, let us acknowledge you. Go ahead. All right, all the persons worshiping. All right, bless you, bless you, bless you. All right, God bless you, Pastor Lyle Darliston. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, amen. Go ahead. Are you saying something? All right, uh, I, I guess not. I guess not, praise the Lord. No, you're, you're not coming through clearly at all. Go, try again. No, not, not good at all. Not hearing you at all. Hello? No, not, not good. Would like to hear you, your, your, your question or your takeaway, but you're not coming through clearly at all. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. All right, God bless you. God bless every one of you. We thank God for a powerful search tonight. We have learned so much. And we thank God for uh, Pastor Willis for building himself to really bring home to us with such clarity. Amen. The, the, the study of the tabernacle, that's an overview, introduction. Uh, it, it's actually a series. If you, you had to go and study it in, the, in Bible school, it would be a subject by itself for a semester. But he did a good job tonight. Amen. In, in, in a way, it was condensed and presented to us. Praise the Lord. All right, let me, there's another raise hand. Let me, uh, Sister Carlene, go ahead. Praise Jesus, everyone. Good night, good night. I greet you all in the matchless name of Jesus. I yes. greet you, uh, Bishop Devon Brown. I greet you, Pastor Willis. The word was powerful. My takeaway from it was- That's where um, you're from. That's, that's where I'm from. from Westchester, Pennsylvania. Okay, bless this you. Is, um, Evangelist Shaw, praise Jesus. All my right. takeaway, my takeaway tonight is um, deal with sin before you approach the Creator. And what I get, we can't, we can't come to God any and any hour. Sometimes we have to know who we have to acknowledge who Jesus is. He's the Holy of Holies. It's the Holy Spirit, and prayers plug us into the power source of God. It unlocked the chains of darkness. So when we come before the throne grace, you can't come with bitterness. You can't come with unforgiveness. You have to come with a pure heart. If you want glory to God, your prayers to be heard. It says, if I hold iniquity in my heart, your prayers can be heard from Jesus. Glory to God. How can you approach the, the creator any and any all? It's not like a normal person. It's the Holy Spirit. You can't see him, but you can feel him. Glory to God. So tonight the word was rich. The word was powerful. I don't uh -huh. know. Uh -huh. Bishop, uh -huh. I don't know because of this pandemic. I have a faith. I have a faith that I have so much trust in God nowadays that let me tell you something, nothing negative, nothing can shake me, nothing can break me. I said they have to storm me like Stephen. I have a passion for the word of God. You pray my strength as I mean well to continue this Christian walk in Jesus' holy name. Praise the Lord. God bless you, Sister Caroline. Uh, Pastor Willis, you know, Pastor Willis? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we, we, we from, from, from new convert class uh, uh, until through my growth and development, many of us, I suppose, uh, we, were, we were told, we were taught that uh, the, the, the priest, the high priest, when he would have gone into the Holy of Holies, yes. he had to, a rope had to be tied to, 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 to do his waist 
And while he's walking around, the bell, the, the bells are sounding. If there and there's if there's no sound, it means he, he, he would have died up there, and no one could go and get him. They would have to pull him out. But you came tonight, and you you said that no one could die or can die in God's presence. Uh, I, 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 we, I'm sure that I'm sure a lot of other person would like to hear more about that. Uh, no. More because that's how we were taught from from from, from forty years ago. <laughs> we were taught about those things, uh, and you're not it and you lied on it. We want to hear from you, sir. Go ahead. It was a Jewish myth that was developed um, in over over the years um, by the Jewish people themselves, but certainly there's no scripture of ev evidence to suggest anything of that nature. And, and you stop and think about it clearly, like I explained. You cannot die in the presence of God. It's not possible. And there were, there were just evidence there in love itself that tells you that you cannot die. So, so each priest was prepared before they actually enter in. These boys who died, they died not in the tabernacle of the court. No, they died outside because God would not allow them. So, so, so God would see long before you're coming in, the condition that you're in. And if, if you're not going to... Um, conform to the prescription you're going to die on the outside but you're not coming into the court of the lord into the presence of god into the holy of holies and die any at all because you cannot die there, there are several miracles there are several miracles that, that 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 was offered to the priest that came in before god to the holy of holies and one of the miracles is that guess what you cannot die because guess what you represent and you have never ever heard it recorded in the history of any high priest ever dying, of all the persons who played the role, you have never heard of a high priest dying ever. It doesn't happen. You cannot die in the presence of Almighty God. It's not possible. My God. Bless you, sir. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. All right. I, I see CJ, the raise and acknowledge, acknowledge CJ. Go ahead. Praise the Lord, everyone. Bless you. Praise the Lord. Um, I just got baptized last year. And wonderful, um, <laughs> wonderful. Congratulations. Yeah, I just got baptized last year um, in November. And the word is very powerful. I'll be honest with you. I my sister Evangelist Shaw is the one who invited me on the line because I live in Pennsylvania also. Yes. And um I was a little tired and the word is just like keeping me up and you know I'm sleeping a little bit and the word is just like so strong it does something awake. holding me. Yes, it wake me. <laughs> yes. But what I've take away is that you know you gotta go to come to the Lord clean, you gotta come pure. You know what I mean? I'm still learning, you know what I mean? I'm still trying to learn and make navigate my way around into the um the Bible right now because here, we're not having a lot of Bible study, and I'm happy that I was able to join on because I do listen to, I don't remember the pastor, what his name is. I do listen from Bethel Portmore. Willis. Willis. Yes, I do watch it on Sunday. I'm from Bethel United Pentecostal Church, 20 So Camp Road. I do go on yes. it to watch them. Then I leave from that, and I go on to his at Bethel Portmore, and I do watch, and I'm telling you, I really enjoy it every Sunday. Even when I go to church, I come home and I make sure I get on YouTube and I go see what's going on, what you preach it today. And, you know, I get feeling. And I'm praying to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm Wonderful. Praying, you know, I don't want to go halfway. I want to go full way because I want to belong to the Lord. So I'm just praying, asking everyone to just pray for me. I know I'm not going to backslide. YouTube but I have channel. made up mine and I baptize and I know the reason why I baptize because I want to be with the Lord and I right. want to make it to heaven. And I hope my husband and my children will join along with me. So I want to be the example in here. So I'm asking everyone to just pray for me and I'm praying for myself to be filled with the Holy Ghost. But the word was very powerful tonight. Very, very powerful. God bless you, Sister CJ. Oh, Wonderful. Amen. Thank Good you. Step. Thank you. Just keep me in your prayer. Thank you. Pastor Willis, may want to say a word or two to her. Um, Sister CJ, don't move. And um, um, I want you to stay awake just for a couple more seconds. As you make mention of you being um 
you're seeking for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I just want to, I just want to help you here where <clears throat> this is a promise that the Lord has made to you. You have it in his word that the promise is unto you. And God is not slack concerning his promises. And what he said he will do, that will he do. Let me, let me share with you just for a brief second, a brief couple of seconds. With the kind of attitude that the disciples ah, yeah. had Abbasata. waiting for the Holy Ghost. Yes. I, you know, Jesus had promised that, yes, I'm going to die. I'm going to get back from the grave. They wondered. They doubted. They, didn't, they weren't sure that this would happen. But, but after the many walkings with Jesus and, and seeing many things that he had done, and then he got back from the grave and he says to them, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. My sister, listen to me. When those disciples went to Jerusalem, there was no wondering in their mind. There was no doubt in their mind. Joel prophesied that it would happen. John the Baptist said, I baptize with water, but there's one coming after me. He's going to baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus said, guess what? Um, if you believe on me, it shall be in you a well, and it's going to spring up in everlasting life, and, and out of your belly shall flow rivers in water. He prophesied of it, and, and, and the disciples struggled. Yes, they did. But after he got up from the grave, there was no doubt in their minds. So when they went to Jerusalem in the upper room, they knew that they were going to receive the Holy Ghost. They were worshiping. They were expectant. They were like, my God, it's about to take place in my heart, in my soul. No wonderings, no doubt. Absolute assurance that I'm going to receive. And I'm saying to you, Sister CJ, the Lord has promised you the word of God is there to tell you, I'm going to, he says, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And that includes you. Once you repent of your sins. Yes. Hallelujah. And you said, Even though, in the wonderful name, Even you too right receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's a promise. And he promised it. And all you got to do is, Lord, here am I. I come for the gift. Thank you, Jesus. And out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Lay the sacrifice on the altar. And God will answer by fire. God bless you, my sister. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you, CJ. We are believing God with you for your husband and for your family. Amen. To be saved and for your home to be one happy, God-fearing amen home. God bless you. We thank you for joining us tonight. Praise thank the Lord. You. God bless Praise you. Praise the God Lord. Bless you. Thank you. All right. Uh, there are no other question, questions. Or takeaways, we will close now. God bless those of you on YouTube. We see your comments. God bless you. Facebook also, God bless you. Amen. We thank God for you. Praise God, Maddie. Praise God. So we will meet you again next week, the Lord Tarris. Amen. Same time, same place. Amen. As we continue with another study in the world, coming to you from Bethel in Stony Hill. God bless you all. Praise the Lord. Let me ask Pastor Willis to just a close in prayer. As we go in Jesus' name, go ahead, Pastor Willis, close us, our guest. Our great God and King, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 We humble our hearts as we come before you, Lord. We tremble at your word, we Almighty God. You are God, Makendo Shama, Jesus Amen. Christ of Nazareth. Lord, you have opened up your word to our hearts tonight. We ask God that we'll, we'll take these words and hide them deep within our souls and yes, apply Lord. them, Lord, as you wash us, Lord, as you cleanse us, Lord, as we desire to go deeper in you, to know you for who you are. You have invited us to come, taste, and see that you are good. And God, my Savior, Jesus, oh, we thank God. you for the dwelling place, your dwelling place. We thank you that you saw it fit to make us your tabernacle, your sanctuary, the temple of the living God. God, I pray that we'll come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of what it really cost you for us to come to that place yeah, where hallelujah. we today become your yeah, tabernacle. Jesus. Help Jesus. us to so live, God, my Savior, Jesus. Hallelujah. Understanding who we are and whose we are and to walk in this earth, demonstrating your power. Oh, Dude from us, God, and yeah, like the walk, Lord, and the shadow brought yeah. healing, Ila Mama. power, 
and your anointing, oh God. Hallelujah. My God, those that are around us and bring light and illumination and revelation and understanding and the infilling of your Holy Spirit, oh God, and touch the hungry hearts and satisfy the hungry souls as we go about, Lord, like you did. My God, you were the tabernacle in the earth, hallelujah, in the flesh, and everywhere you went, you did good. Help us to so do, Lord, like you did, because we have now become the tabernacle. God, my Savior, help us to exemplify you and to model you in the earth. God, we look to you as our source and our strength. We thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do. We thank you for somebody who has heard your word and has been pricked in their hearts and will go deeper in your word. Their appetite has been wet tonight and they'll search out the things that concerns you and your dwelling place and go deeper in you. God, I pray that you'll bless your children, even those online not yet filled, who are to become your tabernacle, your Hallelujah. habitation. Oh Jesus. God, even Sister CJ, we pray, God, yes, and continue Lord. to pray that she, along with others, will become a recipient of your spirit. Oh, God, and manifest your power in the earth. God, do your good pleasure among us in these last and closing days as you get us ready to go home. Oh, God, because we're going to a city. My God and Savior, Jesus Hallelujah. Christ. We look forward to your coming, Lord. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Have your way with us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Bless your children, Lord. Bless our island bishop as he continues to give leadership to the organization. Okay. Lives, not only locally, but also internationally. Oh, God, bless his ministry. Let it grow from strength to strength. Enlarge his territory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, bless your people, God, near and far. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. Lord. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, Pastor. No strange fire. No strange fire. My God. So many, no strange fire. Hallelujah. God bless you, brethren. God bless you, friends. Thanks for joining us. Amen. Please be safe and continue. Amen. With your prayers and your fasting and your worship of God. God is doing a new thing. New thing in this time. God bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Shalom, peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. I bless you all in Jesus' name. God bless you.